Motivation for Conjoint Analysis and Formulating Attribute Lists In a free marketplace, there is always a built-in conflict between buyers and sellers. Buyers want all of the most desirable features at the lowest possible price. On the other hand, sellers want to maximize profits by 1. minimizing costs of providing features and 2. providing products that offer greater overall value than the competition. The typical market research role is to focus first on the demand side of the equation. After figuring out what buyers want, next, assess whether it can be built or provided in a cost-effective manner. Products and services are composed of features or attributes. For example, a credit card consists of brand, plus interest rate, plus annual fee, plus credit limit. Or an online brokerage firm would feature brand, plus fee, plus speed of transaction, plus reliability of transaction, plus research or charting options. If we learn how buyers value the components of a product, we are in a better position to design those that improve profitability. So, how can we learn what customers really want? We might think about asking direct questions about their preferences. These are known as stated preference questions. For example, which brand do you prefer? Which interest rate would you like? Which annual fee would you like? Which credit limit would you like? However, answers to direct stated preference questions are often trivial and unenlightening. For instance, respondents will almost always prefer lower fees to higher fees or higher credit limits to lower credit limits. So, how do we learn what is important? We might think about asking direct questions such as, how important is it that you get the brand or the interest rate or the annual fee or the credit limit that you want? We call these stated importance questions. Stated importance ratings often have low discrimination, with most answers falling in very important categories, as seen on the following chart of average importance ratings on a 10-point scale. These answers are sometimes useful for segmenting the market, but are still not as actionable as they could be. Self-explicated models use a combination of questions like which brands do you prefer and how important is the brand. In other words, it combines ratings of levels within attributes with attribute information ratings in order to estimate overall preference. For each attribute, brand, price, performance, etc., respondents rate or rank the levels within that attribute. Respondents rate an overall importance for the attribute when considering the various levels involved. Preference scores, or utilities, can be developed by multiplying the preferences for levels with the importance of the attribute overall. Self-explicated models can be used to study many attributes and levels in a questionnaire. Some researchers refer to self-explicated models as self-explicated conjoint, but this is a misnomer because no conjoint trade-offs are involved. A challenge with self-explicated models is that respondents typically have a difficult time using stated questions to provide reliable measurements of attribute importance and with enough discrimination between most and least important attributes. In certain cases, Self-explicated models perform as well as conjoint analysis. However, most researchers favor conjoint analysis or discrete-choice modeling when the project allows. So what is conjoint analysis? It is a research technique developed in the early 1970s. It measures how buyers value components of a product or service bundle. The dictionary definition of conjoint is joined together, united, combined, or associated. Marketers sometimes use a catchphrase, features considered jointly. 
we drop some letters and end up with conjoint. Here are some of the important peer-reviewed articles that establish the foundations of conjoint analysis. So, how does conjoint analysis work? There are actually only four steps. First, we vary the product features, which we call independent variables, to build many, usually 12 or more, product concepts. Next, we ask respondents to rate or rank these product concepts, which we call the dependent variable. Step three, based on the respondents' evaluations of the product concepts, we figure out how much unique value or utility each of the features added. And step number four, we regress the dependent variable on independent variables. So the betas equal part worth utilities. So what's so good about conjoint? Well, you can ask more realistic questions. For example, would you prefer a car that has 210 horsepower and gets 70 miles per gallon, or a car that has 140 horsepower but gets 28 miles to the gallon? If you choose the item on the left, you tend to prefer power. If you choose the one on the right, you tend to prefer fuel economy. Rather than ask directly whether you prefer power over fuel economy, we present realistic trade-off scenarios involving different levels of the two attributes and infer preferences based on your multiple product choices. When respondents are forced to make difficult trade-offs, we learn what they truly value. How do you create attributes? Well, attributes are assumed to be independent, such as brand, speed, color, price, and so on. Each attribute has varying degrees or levels. For example, the attribute brand could include Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite. The attribute speed could be 5 pages per minute or 10 pages per minute. The attribute color could include the colors red, blue, green, and black. Now, each level is assumed to be mutually exclusive of the others. So a product has one and only one level of that attribute. Now, what are the rules for formulating attribute levels? Levels are assumed to be mutually exclusive. For example, let's say you had an attribute called add-on features. You might create this single attribute with three levels, sunroof, GPS system, and video screen. But if levels were defined in this way, conjoint analysis assumes the levels are mutually exclusive and you cannot determine the value of providing two or three of these features at the same time. What if you wanted to know how much respondents would like two of the items or all three items? One solution is to create three separate attributes, each with two levels, available and not available, for the three options. Levels should have concrete and unambiguous meaning. Notice the difference between very expensive versus cost $575, or Weight is 5 to 7 kilos versus weight is 6 kilos. One description leaves meaning up to individual interpretation, while the other does not. When possible, don't include too many levels for any one attribute. The typical rule of thumb number is about 3 to 5 levels per attribute. The temptation, for example, is to include many, many levels of price so we can estimate people's preferences for each. But you spread your precious observations across more parameters to be estimated, resulting in noisier or less precise measurements of all price levels. The better approach, usually, is to interpolate between fewer, more precisely measured levels for not asked about prices. Whenever possible, try to balance the number of levels across quantitatively natured attributes. There is a well-known bias in conjoint analysis called the number of levels effect. Holding all else constant, attributes defined on more levels than others will be biased upwards in importance. 
For example, price defined as $10, $12, $14, $16, $18, and $20 will receive higher relative importance than when defined as $10, $15, and $20, even though the same range was measured. The number of levels effect is mainly a concern for quantitative or price and speed attributes. For categorical attributes like brand or color, it is probably best just to imitate what is available in the real world. Another suggestion is to make sure levels from your attributes can combine freely with one another without resulting in utterly impossible combinations. Very unlikely combinations are typically okay. And resist temptation to make attribute prohibitions. Attribute prohibitions occur when you prohibit levels from one attribute from occurring with levels from other attributes. Sometimes a product is shown with all the best features at the lowest price or two attribute levels that would not naturally occur in the real world are paired together. The inclination is simply to prohibit such combinations. But respondents can imagine many possibilities that the study commissioner doesn't plan to or can offer. By avoiding prohibitions, we usually improve the estimates of the combinations that we actually focus on. But for advanced analysts, some carefully chosen prohibitions are okay and may even be helpful. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit sawtoothsoftware.com.